Hi, I'm Chase Drum, AutoLine's new West Coast correspondent based in Portland, Oregon. Today, I'm joined by Wade Higgins, the Director of Customer Success at Freewire Technologies. Great right. to see you again, Wade. Good to see you uh, too, Chase. Yeah, thank you. We'd love to hear a bit of what you're working on and what Freewire is up to. Sure thing. So uh, at Freewire, I'm managing customer success and the field service team, and we're building battery back chargers, which are exactly what they sound like. We've got some tech that's designed to be mobile, really flexible to be used in parking lots or potentially in a rescue charging situation. But the, the real product that we're excited about that's coming out imminently is called the Boost Charger, which is a battery backed fast charger that's specifically designed to go at gas stations. For the first product, is that more mostly used from uh, companies like AAA or others that are trying to revive or maybe on the go for intermediate until they get a full-time charger put in place? Or who are the kind of current customers for that product? Great question. Uh, it can definitely be used in the scenario that you just discussed, Chase. That said, the chargers that we've built to date have been approximately the same size as a shopping cart. So something that would potentially be a little bit big for a, a tow truck, uh, but it absolutely could be used in that sort of use case. Our primary customers for that have been um, big tech companies that have uh, parking lots with employees that are just overflowing with EVs where they literally can't build infrastructure fast enough. So we're a great supplement to existing fixed infrastructure there. Um, but we're also increasingly expanding into the world of fleet electrification, companies that have an increasingly large number of electric vehicles as part of a large fleet. And same thing, they're encountering some challenges to putting in a lot of infrastructure to, be able to charge all those vehicles simultaneously. And we're able to literally drive a battery out into the middle of a parking lot and charge an EV where it sits. I know FreeWire is based in the Bay Area, but it sounds like you're getting quite a bit of demand all over the US for these products, correct? That's correct. I would say that at the present moment, a bulk of our business is in California, uh, but one of our biggest investors is BP, who obviously has gas stations across all of the United States. So I anticipate our footprint expanding quite a bit. I mean, right now for electric vehicles, the biggest concern after the range is actually the charging. And I think that's what most people who have and drive EVs on a normal basis actually realize. Yes. They don't have to deal with on a day to day, but if they want to go explore, kind of do the American road trip, they really have to have that right infrastructure in place. Right now, what is it that you're seeing as far as the demand between level two chargers, which might be used at home, to more of the DC fast charging that really does enable those speedy trips across the US? Sure, so I, I think an important thing to take in just keep in mind when you're talking about driving electric is you need to really think about what the use case is, exactly where are you driving, what, where are your miles occurring. And level twos are phenomenal because something like 95% of all EV miles that are driven do actually come from a level two charger. If you're charging at your workplace, if you're charging at home, that's incredibly convenient. It's obviously very different from refueling a gas car, but um, it's still, very, very convenient to be able to just plug in, forget about it, let your car charge while it's parked, and then it's full when you need to go somewhere. But to your point, Chase, about the American road trip, you're absolutely right. An eight-hour charge time just won't cut it. People are used to the five-minute splash and dash or at the most, you know, 30 to hour-long stop while you have some lunch, use the restroom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in that regard, thankfully, we are starting to see a lot more DC fast chargers blanketing the highways of the United States. Tesla obviously has a pretty robust supercharger network. Electrify America, which has a lot of Volkswagen money, has been deploying a lot of EV chargers all across highways throughout the United States as well. So I would certainly say it's getting easier to be able to do a road trip in an electric vehicle. Uh, but I think that's definitely something that prevents a lot of folks in the United States from buying an EV right now. Uh, and like I said, the boost charger that we have coming out is really designed to go at gas stations. And while I mentioned, I think level twos are really the principal way that most people will actually refuel their EV most of the time. If you do want to do a road trip, you need to have fast chargers. Right. Level two is kind of what you'd find at home or maybe at someone's uh, place of work where they have some chargers set up in a parking garage. Mm -hmm. And when you want to look at kind of this larger scale, that's where you get to the Tesla or Electrify America DC fast charging where it's about 150 kilowatts or more, depending. Yep. When you're seeing the rollout for this technology, I mean, I think that the biggest concern I've always heard about is really 
the speed versus the cost of installation. And I think that's what's really interesting about FreeWire Technologies product is it really allows to kind of bridge that gap and yeah. also put into uh, these charging devices in places that usually would be much more expensive for getting the actual um, concrete and foundation that might need to be torn up or mm -hmm. other kind of wiring uh, challenges. Anything yeah. you can kind of speak to that with what you've been seeing with the implementations? Absolutely. So what you just mentioned, Chase, in our industry is really called soft costs. And soft costs yeah. can typically cost just as much as the hardware, sometimes even more for installing a DC charger. And the hardware is unquestionably expensive as well. If you really think about it, gas station hardware is incredibly expensive too. You know, to build out a gas station, you're typically looking at at least a million dollars. Um, and what the Boost Charger can do is it can functionally replace an existing level two charger. You can take an existing AC input that is ubiquitous out there and you can functionally plug in a Boost Charger uh, which has a 160 kilowatt hour battery in it. So it has a very low impact on the grid. It's relatively inexpensive to actually install, um, but it can still pump out 120 kilowatts DC to a vehicle, which is the sort of fast speed that you expect if you're trying to take a road trip. We're specifically targeting gas stations, not only because BP obviously is a gas station owner, but if you think about gas stations, Americans are already very used to going there to refuel their vehicle. But to actually install a fast charger at a gas station has some incredible complexities. You're looking at potentially upgrading a transformer, which can easily run fifty dollars to $100,000. You would need to close the gas station for several months in order to do a traditional installation, which is millions of lost revenue. And on top of that, you're just you're trying to dig up a bunch of concrete and put in high voltage electrical conduit wire in an area where you already have tanks of explosible flammable liquid in the ground as well. So installing fast chargers is unquestionably expensive and challenging. And while our hardware is certainly expensive, uh, we do mitigate a lot of costs in, in insulation, in those soft costs that I mentioned. Tell us a little bit about the current uh, cost of charging car. There's kind of been the balance between a per kilowatt basis versus the charge time and any interest that the uh, company FreeWire is seeing between those business models and how that's rolling out for charging uh, costs to the uh, user? To, to be honest, Chase, I think you know that's still something that is a pretty new concept for a lot of EV drivers out there. Uh, I think that billing for the energy that you get makes the most sense. When you go to a gas station right now, uh, you're not billed for how long you're, you're plugged in and how long the gas is flowing for. You're billed for how many gallons you use. And that makes a whole lot of sense for EVs as well. Unfortunately, in some states, um, that's actually currently illegal. Unless you're a utility, you can't sell electricity to an individual. So I think that there's definitely some regulatory pieces that need to uh, be changed before that's possible all throughout the United States. Um, but in the meantime, billing on a per time basis is a way to get around that rule. The problem is, is that um, if you ever notice at a gas station where when you start pumping the first 10 or so gallons or even five gallons, they go very, very quickly. You, you can fill those up very, very fast. But then as you get really close to filling up your tank, it starts to slow down. That, that rate of, of flow starts to slow down. And it's fundamentally exactly the same with an, an EV charger. The only difference is that the threshold for cutoff is about 80%. Um, and so above 80%, the car will actually tell the charger, slow down, give me less power. Um, and if you're billing on a per time basis, then topping up that extra little bit at the top, it becomes marginally far more expensive, even though you're only getting an incremental additional amount of electricity. So you can spend more money topping up from 80 to 100% than you potentially would from five to 80%. I think that does, I mean, maybe trying to be optimistic, that does give the advantage of how Tesla is modeling it to at least get um, incentivized more cars to be charged instead Certainly. of everyone filling all the way up. Mm -hmm. uh, and just a lot of data does show that when people are on road trips, they usually don't fill it all the way up. They just fill up to how far they need to the next charger or their destination. Yeah, but that, exactly right. uh, yeah that, this is great to hear that there's uh, currently a company doing this and really bridging that gap for owners of properties and just business owners that can really make this a lot easier for mm -hmm. users. 
Uh, real quickly, how, how does someone find out more about FreeWire Technologies? Well, freewiretech.com is a phenomenal way to do so. But um, <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, as the Boost Charger gets announced, which is should be happening later this quarter, I think Q3 at the latest of this year, um, you know, BP is going to be pretty vocal about this as well. Uh, there's a number of big oil companies that have already been making a lot of plays into refueling infrastructure for electric vehicles in Europe as well. And the U.S. has lagged a little behind there, but I would say 2020 and 2021 are going to be big catch-up years as well. So I think you're going to see a lot of that as well. Another point I'd just like to touch on really fast, Chase, that you mentioned as well, is that for a business owner who's potentially looking at putting in a fast charger, um, a big challenge of the economics of fast charging so far has been what are called demand charges. And this is something that the utility charges when you use a lot of power. And this happens, you, you'll incur a demand charge even if you use a lot of power for even a second. And, and these demand charges can often sometimes double or triple the bill. And because of the way our tech works, of having that battery buffer, as I mentioned, we have a very low impact on the grid. We're never pulling more than 20 kilowatts off the grid, which is nowhere near enough to incur a demand charge. Existing chargers out there, if six cars plug in at the same time and they're all asking for 150 kilowatts, that's obviously this huge momentary spike in lots and lots of power. That moment alone can easily trigger five to $10,000 of demand charges for just that wow. single moment. And so a big advantage for property owners that the Boost Charger has is that it mitigates all of those demand chargers. And those can be very significant. We're talking about easily fifty to $60,000 of savings on demand charges alone per year. And so on the demand charge savings alone, our charger pays for itself in under three years. Wow, that's really impressive, actually. I think what really does stand out is not only that savings to the owner and operator, but really the scalability that this provides with that flexibility of being able to see which facilities are going to be able to use it the most and also avoid a lot of those uh, hidden costs that I think a lot of people don't quite realize when they're putting this in. It's still much more cost effective than the uh, options out there, like a full on gas station, like you mentioned, with it easily costing millions of dollars and now all the different um, uh, permitting and other challenges you might run into. But uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you, Wade. And I think that's going to wrap up today's AutoLine exclusive. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me, Chase. Good to see you.